It's not clear to what degree you're specified by your genes. So here's one possibility. So let's say that encoded in your genetic structure are a whole variety of potential U's. Like, who knows how many? All the potential U's that the entire history of mankind has been able to weave into their genetic structure. They're all sitting down there, encoded in your genes. And then that very complex structure that's rife with potential pops out into a particular environment. And then it interacts with that environment, like a program interacts with a computer, and gathers information of one form or another. And it takes that information and the material that it incorporates and builds the real you out of that. And that's what Piaget was studying. He was trying to figure out how does a child go about taking itself from, you know, this thing that just lays there and squats, basically, to so something that's, you know, you go on YouTube and you see what people can do, what human beings can do. It's bloody unbelievable. I mean, we're so ridiculously versatile. People can do things that are just impossible in, in every dimension, you know, intellectually, physically, spiritually. They can even eat hot dogs at a rate that you can hardly imagine. You know, <laughs> we're very variable. And Piaget was very interested in trying to figure out how all of that embodied variability could come out of this little package of potential at the beginning of life. It's very interesting. So that's constructivism. How does the individual construct him or herself from nothing in some ways, from birth forward? And so Piaget, especially his discussion of infant development, sort of like the analysis of the unfolding of a human being. And because people really do unfold too, you know, because babies, when they're born, they're all crunched up like this. And so they have to stretch <coughs> themselves out and, you know, get going. And, that was Piaget's concern. So, so that's, that's good. And then we go from there to depth psychology. You might think about that more as psychoanalysis. Now, people have, people aren't very happy, generally speaking, about psychoanalytic theory, especially if they're research oriented. But there's a variety of reasons for that. And one of them is, they don't know anything about it, that would be the first reason, and people are often tempted to denigrate anything they don't understand. It's actually kind of hard to understand psychoanalytic thinking. It's, in fact, it's very hard. And the other thing about like, scientists and research scientists who are engaged in psychological work is they're actually usually fairly mentally healthy. You know, at least they're healthy enough to, to be scientists, which, you know, you've got to be pretty healthy to be a scientist. You've got to be disciplined. You've got to be able to get up and go to work every day. You have to be able to think about complex things. You have to be very orderly and persistent, you know. And so it, there's a lot of demand on you if you're a scientific researcher. So the problem with scientific research is they hang around with other scientific researchers, and then they think that's what human beings are like. And human beings are nothing like scientific researchers. They're a tiny minority of the population, and they're as bizarre as, like, albino buffalo. And to, to think of them as representative of human beings is insane. First of all, most of them have IQs in the 99th percentile, so it's like, why bother even thinking about them? Normal human beings are very weird, especially the ones that don't function well. And not functioning well is, is a bottomless pit. That, that's why hell is a bottomless pit, by the way. Because not functioning well is a bottomless pit. And if you're dealing with people who aren't functioning well, one of the most mysterious things is how they can take a situation that's god-awful beyond your worst imaginings and then think up three or four creative ways to make it worse. And if you're dealing with someone like that, and you do if you're a clinician, if you're dealing with someone like that, good luck with your behavioral interventions. Man, that's like throwing sticks at an elephant. You're just not going to get anywhere. And one of the ways I want to demonstrate this to you, I'm going to show you a film called Crumb. Crumb's a harsh film, but it's the best documentary, by the way, of an underground comic named Robert Crumb, who's actually quite a genius, even though he's perverse in precisely the Freudian ways that are interesting. And his brothers are even worse. So I'll walk you through that, because I can't figure out any other way of giving you a taste of what Freudian psychopathology is like. It's not pretty. And that's the other reason that sort of clean-minded research scientists don't like psychoanalytic thinking. Because it's really, in many ways, it deals with the most disgusting elements of human behavior. And so, 
It's not even that pleasant to think about. And then there's Jung, who we'll talk about after Freud. And Jung is so strange that he makes Freud look normal. And <laughs> Jung believed that, as, as I mentioned earlier, believed that there is a universal grammar of ethics, of morality. It's not arbitrary, it's not relative. You know, in the universities, the theory has been, at least since the 1960s, that one person's ethics is as good as another person, and there's no way of distinguishing reliably between them. Well, I happen to think that's absolute nonsense. It's also extremely dangerous nonsense. And I also think there's no evidence for it whatsoever, because we now know a lot about human universals, which are aspects of human behavior that are constant across all cultures. And there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. And the other thing is, there's just not that many ways that half-mad primates can gather together in large groups and live productively. It's not easy. Like, you think of all the civilization work that went into allowing all you people from all these different cultures to sit here in peace and comfort. It's mind-boggling. If you think there's a million ways to do that, well, think again. Maybe there's one way to do that. You know, and we do it well enough, so here we are. And no one's being knifed. So, 